Good morning, and welcome to the Lost and Found Book Review. In 1790, Edmund Burke penned a letter to a gentleman in Paris covering his thoughts on the French Revolution. His few-page letter quickly ballooned into a couple hundred, which he then intended to get published in order to reach a wider audience. Burke's prose are aristocratic, dense, and can be a little off-putting, but you do get the sense that his writing style is meant to be meaningfully specific, not necessarily wasteful. As I see it, reflections on the revolution in France can be divided into two major themes. His philosophical grounds for the benefits of the established order, and his practical critiques of the French National Assembly's revolutionary policies. We'll look at two examples of each of these themes. You will observe that from the Magna Carta to the Declaration of Right, it has been the uniform policy of our Constitution to claim and assert our liberties as an entailed inheritance derived to us from our forefathers, and to be transmitted to our posterity as an estate specially belonging to the people of this kingdom, without any reference whatever to any more general or prior right. By this means, our Constitution preserves a unity in so great a diversity of its parts. We have an inheritable crown, an inheritable peerage, and a House of Commons, and a people inheriting privileges, franchises, and liberties from a long line of ancestors. Burke appeals to two elements when justifying the current social order. First, he creates a distinction between abstract freedom and actual freedom. It is his opinion that order is the cause of the actual freedom people enjoy, as opposed to the abstract rights found in the French revolutionary document, the Declaration of the Rights of Man. It is for this reason that he emphasizes reform instead of revolution, keeping the good of past systems while replacing their deficient parts. The second element is that freedom is passed down from generation to generation, slowly accumulating more liberty from the reforms of wise statesmen both past and present. This creates a bond between generations and a natural grounding for the existence of the liberties each Englishman enjoys. And while I appreciate Burke's attempt to ground freedom in reality, I find his whole approach a little misguided. The current social order, whatever that may be, produces a kind of liberty in the sense that there is a stable set of social relations that most everyone understands and adheres to. But the interests of most people are only attended to by the conception of what is good for them by their all too often deaf rulers. When the masses have both no place in which to air their grievances and the ability to force institutions of power to respond to them, it is only a matter of time until tensions break down the way things are. If the virtuous and wise statesmen Burke is so fond of are in fact so virtuous and wise, they would make the necessary reforms with a sense of self-sacrifice for the good of the nation. There are practical limitations for sure, but the amoral disposition and vain opulence of the rich are not practical limitations, they are ideological ones. If statesmen were angels, people wouldn't demand democracy. I readily admit, indeed I should lay it down as a fundamental principle, that in a Republican government which has a democratic basis, the rich do require an additional security above what is necessary to them in monarchies. They are subject to envy, and through envy to oppression. <sighs> rich tears are always the saltiest. This is a common strain of Republican thought at the time, that democracy in the political realm will lead to democracy in the economic realm. And they're right. While in a monarchy, the poor have no place in which to advocate for their interests and can be subjugated through brute force, republics are required to limit democracy to the extent that the interests of the rulers are not threatened by the interests of the masses. The people generally want such horrid things as affordable food, shelter, and land reform, which of course the wealthy cannot allow. An unelected legislative body like a senate comes into being for the express purpose of defending the landed interests of the wealthy. Burke justifies this denial by accusing people who do not want to be poor of being envious. Envy is wanting your neighbor's five-bedroom house in Mercedes. Wanting to know where your next meal comes from does not qualify as envy. Of course, envy does exist for those without, but the unyielding pathological conservatism of the rich does nothing but inflame the passions of what would have been much more reasonable people if treated compassionately and equitably. <laughs> What? A qualification on the indefeasible rights of men? Yes, but it shall be a very small qualification. While I strongly disagree with Burke's moral and social positions, he does a fine job dissecting the hypocrisy of the revolutionary government in France. Burke observes their multi-level democratic scheme. The people elect delegates to the canton, which elect delegates to the commune, which elect delegates to the department, which then finally send delegates to the National Assembly. This creates a great distance between the population and the sovereign legislative body. The diluting of democracy is further compounded by financial requirements on who can vote and who could become delegates to the different levels of government. Burke rightly points out that both of these schemes betray, if not the letter of the document that is the rights of man, certainly its spirit. The power of the city of Paris is evidently one great spring of all their politics. 
It is through the power of Paris, now become the center and focus of jobbing, that the leaders of this faction direct, or rather command, the whole legislative and the whole executive government. Everything therefore must be done which can confirm the authority of that city over the other republics. The other divisions of the kingdom being hackled and torn to pieces, and separated from their habitual means, and even principles of union, cannot, for some time at least, confederate against her. Here Burt brings another strong criticism to the particular social order the National Assembly put forth, which is the domination of the rural by the urban. While in the reshuffling of political organization, the countryside was divided by neat geometrical lines that had nothing to do with either geography or culture, Paris's natural divisions remained intact. Also due to the large concentration of people in Paris and the revolution itself being generated by Paris, revolts to republic policies by a principally disenfranchised rural population were inevitable. The most famous of the resistances to the new French Republic was the War in the Vendée, which was a response to the dechristianization and church land confiscation policies of the Republic. Burke saw something of this sort occurring a full three years before it actually happened. What Burke gets praised for in his critique is predicting the totalitarian escalation and repression of later forms of the French Republic. He does get points for that, but he almost goes out of his way of accusing the principles of the rights of man as the genesis of these excesses, rather than the deeply flawed structures and policies of the revolutionary government. I mean, it is possible that if the French Republic lived up to its democratic ideals, things could have been resolved more equitably. So on the one side, we have a criticism of democratic forms, but on a situation Burke observes his very undemocratic features. Furthermore, Burke repeatedly refers to the ways of nature and hereditary bonds as a way to ground his version of liberty into reality, with the convenient justification of his own political structure of England, which had many moral conundrums of its own like the brutal colonization of India. I find the arguments against democracy have a couple distinct features. First, their arguments focus on how oppressive the people will be, generally phrased as the tyranny of the minority by the majority, but it is explicitly stated that they really mean the tyranny of the rich by the poor. Their lands will be redistributed, their power diminished, their interests brought into equitable levels with the rest of the population. I find it really interesting that Burke does not provide a single example to the French revolutionaries as to what policies they should pursue to meet their democratic ideals, with all his self-proclaimed wisdom, virtue, and skill as a statesman. Second, a conception of the people by the rich and intellectual classes as stupid, ignorant, and superstitious is often used as another justification for the established order. This is commonly shown as a parent-child relationship, with the nobility being the parent and the people being the children. The wise, refined, and noble parent looks after the immature and ignorant masses. Rather than take this as a sign that the upper classes ought to foster social programs like education and favorable working conditions for human development, they consistently deny people these things to fund wasteful wars and monuments of opulence. The most extreme iteration can be found in arguments for slavery. The slaves are characterized as naturally brutish, stupid, and immoral, and yet are subjected to such conditions that would not allow them the ability to even conceive of personal actualization. In sum, I think Burke stands as a great example of ideological boundaries. In his preface remarks to the text The Sublime and Beautiful, he had this to say, If an inquiry thus carefully conducted should fail at last to discovering the truth, it may answer and end perhaps as useful, in discovering to us the weakness of our own understanding. If it does not make us knowing, it makes us modest. If it does not preserve us from error, it may at least from the spear from error. It may make us cautious with pronouncing with positiveness or with haste, when so much labor may end with so much uncertainty. This is not a man who wishes to trivialize the task at hand for humanity, which is perhaps why he was so averse to the simple declarations of the French Revolution. But, my own reflective question would be, if Burke spoke out against English tyranny, with its own set of structural problems, would we even know who Edmund Burke was? Would he have just been tossed to the side as a traitor and dissident? I'm thinking yes. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next week.